Hello, and welcome to the Modern Platonist YouTube channel. Today, I'm having as a guest uh, Dr. Benjamin Teitelbaum, Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology and International Affairs at the University of Colorado Boulder. Welcome, Ben. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be with you, Boaz. Uh, Dr. Teitelbaum is uh, known, I think, for uh, a book that um, some of the viewers of this channel uh, may have read uh, uh, called uh, War for Eternity, uh, which is, I think, a very epical book that's been published quite recently on um, how the alt-right and the, the populist political wave in the West has been uh, having some of uh, elements of the traditionally school uh, in there, uh, in the figures that we are going to be uh, seeing today um, that uh, are quite challenging, quite uh, uh, complex and, uh, and uh, diverse in, in terms of approach. And uh, this book has, uh, has, I think, put back to the scope uh, traditionalism, uh, capital T, uh, as, a, as, a, as a movement or as a uh, school of thought uh, in the West, and uh, today we wanna we wanna see what is the uh, the impact that traditionalism is having not only in the 2010s in the past decade, but also today as a school. But Ben is not only uh, known for the study of the populist right or the traditional school. Actually, um, he he earned his PhD from Brown University and he did studies at the Royal College of Music in Stockholm and Harvard University with a Bachelor of Music. I mean, you, you'll have to tell us a little bit about that too. Uh, and uh, he's been uh, he's been an instructor of head Nordic studies uh, in, uh, also in the Colorado, uh, University of Colorado. Uh, prior to coming to the College of Music. Um, I think you have uh, a, another book, um, Lions of the North, Sounds of the, Nor the New Nordic Radical Nationalism from 2017, that is already bridging some of the topics of your uh, research and uh, academic position and uh, topics that you're exploring in War for Eternity. Uh, I'll, but I'll let you talk. I'm talking too much already. So welcome. And uh, let's start with uh, how's traditionalis traditionalism today? What is traditionalism like today? Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm assuming it's okay that I don't, I don't define traditionalism. I'm, I, I take it that we have an informed, uh, informed audience. We have an informed audience. Okay. I think traditionalism, it's a wonderful question. You have no idea, Boaz, like how nice it is that I don't have to define traditionalism. <laughs> that takes up, you know, that takes up half of a podcast and then and then there's nothing else to say really. Um, what makes this an interesting question for me in particular is, is I think the definition of schools, ideologies, ideological families, it has to take into consideration the very question you just answered. What is actually happening on the ground? Not what are the abstract ideas floating around the cosmos, but what are real people doing with the ideas today? And if you ask it in that way, I think you see traditionalism as, as being scattered in multiple directions, as having multiple camps that mutually would like to uh, deny one another, um, mm -hmm. even though, even, even though it's, it's somewhat asymmetrical. But they can't necessarily, and and what I mean, the 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 center, the nucleus of that situation, is Alexander Dugan, I think. Um, you you have traditionalism emerging first not as a political movement, but as a spiritual and and religious school, philosophical school, something in those in those areas, which, in in many ways, according to Rene Guénon, uh, in in particular, rejected the political. Even though in some ways he turned around, it seemed yeah. kind of hypocritical. He turned around and 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 made some fairly compelling and and, and articulate political statements, um, but they still officially rejected the political as being something meaningless and corrupt, and and devoted themselves instead to concepts that are not made for political sound bites, eminence and transcendence, mm -hmm. right? Um, and Julius Evola comes along, it. You, you get this period of experimentation with, with political activism on part of him. He eventually recoils from that in part because of political defeat of, of his yes. of fascism and Nazism. 
traditionalism continues in its previous incarnations to exist outside of the world of politics. Fritjof Schon, um, various other thinkers. I mean, we we would have to uh, uh, talk about Nasser as well um, in the United States, and. Uh, slowly, political traditionalism comes back via a revival of Julius Evola. I think I think the great great the the scene in England and Great Britain has to be has to be viewed as a flashpoint there. But the big thing was Alexander Dugan, and starts to once again say that political teachings can inspire and explain political activism and in, in, in a political state of affairs. Um, who says that the opposition between modernity and tradition should be read in geopolitical terms and we should act on it in that way. Um, and Dugan starts uh, really in the wake of his of his other political activism, whether it is uh, you know the Eurasianist Union and all of his all of his mm-hmm. Eurasianist uh, initiatives throughout the world, uh, some of his his pseudo diplomatic work on on part of either wealthy Russians or the Russian state, depending on how you look at it. All of that carries a new definition of traditionalism with it. Um, you get these new resistance groups around the world that are very loosely defined and often led by, by somewhat volatile personalities um, who change yeah. and break away in and out all the time. But all, all of that is is part now the legacy of traditionalism. So let me... Politics and Russian and, and, and kind of Russian geopolitics are part of what traditionalism is today, whether or not the esoterics and the spiritualists want it to be. Yeah, this is this is a very interesting uh, trend. Mm, was you, you had extensive interviews with Dugin, and I invite uh, the viewers, if, if they haven't, to buy and read the book because mm-hmm. the wealth of material there, it's... It's incredible and it's really informative. Um, you have extensive interviews with Dugin. Uh, is he aware that he's breaking with a kind of a um, stance of the school that he adheres? Is he aware that uh, he's passing to these resistance groups that you're mentioning a vision that is completely different from what it was in the 1920s and 1930s um, or is more spontaneous in the making and not fully aware of what is going on i don't I've, it's it's a wonder i've never asked him that question so i don't know my personal instinct is that it's the latter that you mentioned mm-hmm. that, that this is there's there's kind of a period of improvisation that um and then we just kind of end up with the situation we do he told me in one of our conversations, uh, I, we were having a discussion about time cycles and cyclic time. And, and it was, I was getting fairly pedantic in my questioning to him. I was like, okay, when does the golden age and when did we enter the dark age? When is it going? And, and he kind of stopped me in my tracks and said, you know, um, traditionalism is kind of a road sign. He said to Mark Sedgwick, I think in, in one instance, he said, traditionalism is just a language. And you don't worship the sign, the road sign, and you don't worship the language. Um, you, you pay attention to the ideas that are embedded beneath. To me, the reason I, I mentioned that because that's why my suspicion is that he's a little bit more loose in his definitions um, and in his thinking about this, that he he's happy to break with formalities and and also willing, untroubled, unencumbered by those instances, those times when it seems like he might be departing from a particular paragraph that René Gounon published. Mm-hmm. And I think I think he looks at the big picture, um, big picture core of traditionalism, which in his mind might be different from what the big picture core of traditionalism is for someone else. Nonetheless, it's a license to uh, to break with certain dogma and still think that you're being true to traditionalism. Yeah, he, he doesn't function as a canonizer, but the how he well, l- leaves the contradiction of political action opposed to uh, even Evola's political action that took quite a different route, even forced by the, the circumstances of the lateral impacts, et cetera. But 
how he how he lives that because he probably is the one that is more vocal and you you may correct me uh, it's more vocal than Bannon for example in terms of his inspiration I'm not I don't mm-hmm. dare to say affiliation or Derns, but inspiration from the the traditionalist thinkers how how he handles mm. some of the ethos that permits the writing that is so geared towards the no action non-action this is the wu way that's simply this is not the route that spiritual people should take mm-hmm. yeah uh, that's uh, i mean first i think he he like bannon seems to have some sense of when it is a good idea to conceal traditionalist hmm. sources of inspiration right we don't in in and really, probably Dugan's most influential work to date, Foundations of Geopolitics, 1997, he, we don't, we don't get some treatment on the, you know, caste hierarchy and its relationship with cyclic time or anything like that. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, there's, there's some implicit concepts in there. You can see how the same, you know, Dugan in that text and Dugan in other texts are, are, are really the same person. But so, so that's, that's something to bear in mind. But when I've asked, and I have spoken to him about this, I've said, well, why aren't you writing The Tiger? You know, Julius Evola concluded that we live in an age of liberalism. Um, and there's, there's really, there, there are limits to what activism can achieve in Julius Evola's mind. So why, why, why is the situation different for, uh, in, in your case? That was one of the moments when, also, I think, I think that was something that I was discussing with him also, when he was in, in a lead up to him talking about, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to get bogged down in details. Don't worry about the details. And, and with that somewhat incomplete explanation, my mind also turns to the fact that he views the Dark Age, the Kali Yuga, um, this, this state of irretrievable loss and decline as being, yes, true, perhaps for Russia, but slightly more true for the West, a West which he considers himself external to. And, and I think that that is, that's kind of the ideological machinery for him to say, uh, okay, you know, the United States, Great Britain, the Atlanticists are lost, but I, mm-hmm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not actually um, compelled to the same fate as they are. And activism might actually have uh, uh, obtained, in my case, in ways that it doesn't. Uh, for a Westerner. Yeah. But again, it's very hard to answer this question, Boaz, with, with, without actually having him here to, to say it and actually having his his specific thoughts uh, in, in a more clear form. Yeah, actually, yeah, this is something that, um, for example, uh, he's, he's so entrenched in geopolitical uh, thought, but the inspiration is there. And this is, uh, this is something that I think uh, through Arctos has been very uh, visible to a mm-hmm. to a western audience that has picked up the the spirit of the text and uh, when uh, <laughs> when a publisher has a catalog and the catalog has kind of a harmony or a pretended yep. harmony uh it's a pack and i i think this this is this is a, this is a, this is something that uh it goes with Dugin. It's a pack, and the pack is buying him with Evola, because they are promoted in equal terms. Yes, yes. And you yeah. know more about Arctos than me, so please. Uh... Oh, I, th- I, I love that. I love that you're bringing this up. I mean, not just not just the pairing of Dugin and Evola, and and the you know it makes makes these the contemporary reception of these thinkers. It probably draws attention to their uh, to their disagreements. But we also end up reading Evola Dugan alongside Elaine de Benoit mm-hmm. and, and the French New Right, the which is, uh, to me, honestly, it is, is, is much more an intelligible pairing than what Elaine de Benoit seems to want to admit. But Elaine <laughs> de Benoit, it's, his kind of his pastime, his leitmotif, his refrain is that commentators always got him wrong, right? And yeah. don't, don't associate him with, with anyone else because. 
um, because there's there's kind of a raw originality, and that's not not to say he's not an original thinker, but um, it's it when you get into the Arctos world, when you get into their list, their pack, as you say, of of texts. To me, that also shows us that traditionalism is is part of another sort of another block of intellectual thinkers that includes what recently, what until recently was called identitarianism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and um, and and there are different ways when you read about, let's say, Guillaume Fay writing about the fall, the Great Fall, and you know, sort of a, a state of decline. It, it's it's very easy to see see that as a sort of distillation, popularizing, re a rendering of, of traditionalist notions of, uh, of cyclic time and decline in the dark age. When you, see, when you hear them writing so much about metapolitics mm -hmm. uh, being a necessity because political consensus at the moment will not allow a genuinely anti-liberal um, politics, so why, why forge a political party, why start a revolution if, if, the, if the deep current of society is against you that too seems to you know is that just an accident that it accords so well with traditionalism's notion of, of a sort of fated political character to an era um that you know you, we're going to end up in a political era of materialism and egalitarianism and borderlessness and and you're going to be limited in your in your ability to do anything about that because that's it's just an underlying bridge and we should expect that the political left and right even though they might fight each other and say that they're their ultimate enemies that they all actually share this deeper this deeper character to it and therefore if you want to change the character you need to move outside of politics to do it all that that whole world in which traditionalism can can very easily participate it's made manifest and visible and clear through Arctos, I think, yeah. <laughs> among other places, but especially through Arctos uh, in, 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 ways we, in ways we don't see elsewhere. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the relevance of, of Arctos, I think, you, you, you play this card very well in the book and you acknowledge the relevance and the importance they have had in, in distributing the, the writings of Julius Zevola, which were only available through inner traditions before, which I mean, That's the major. Yeah, major, it's right. yeah. pretty much a different type of publisher. But um, what are we seeing here is some kind of a elaboration as well from the editors in Arctos. Uh, and I'm thinking, for example, that a British individual who lives in, uh, in Sardinia that uh, tries to actualize, the name escapes me right now, I'm so bad with names, um, that tries to actualize the through his blog and some of the publications that uh, small booklets that Arctos has. He has a collection of booklets that uh, actualize Evola, especially the traditionalist school. And he's pretty much embedded in the um, in the spiritual side, which it's understandable, but at the same mm -hmm. time, um, it goes well beyond even a metapolitical framework because it's too active so mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've i've seen this uh arise uh very clearly and the space is um is filling quickly with this type of uh you know uh, then vulgarization of the message this thing is we have the level is evola then we have these editors in Arctos because he's he's not the only one and you you know one of the Mm -hmm. The first editor, I think, is uh, in, in Arctos. And then you have all the social media, what social media brings, and how um, in the last few years, Evola has become kind of a, a meme figure uh, on, on, on social media, which gets these pills of ideas that mm -hmm. spread widely. But the yeah, interest... The things, right? Yeah, but the, the interest of the pills, what, what they are pulling from the writings of, of Evola, it's definitely uh, not the spiritual material, I would say, it's a very low percentage of spiritual material, but the political one. And how we have to understand all this mix, because here we have kind of a, yeah, we, we pull from this, we pull from that, but at the end, there is not a decisive or clear uh, course of action. Right, right. So there's 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 a like there's a collection of memes. I'm trying to catalog them because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But there's a there's a collection of memes of like Evola memes in the sort of vaporwave aesthetic, mm -hmm. the Miami Vice, yeah. neon light, George, you know, uh, David Hasselhoff uh, sort of thing going on where, you know, you have people surfing. It's a surf the Kaliuga, ride the tiger, yeah. and, you know, there's some kind of neon neon sign, and um, that might be the ultimate extreme and. So yes, if you think about the directives, if you think about the the ideological density of, uh, I don't know, revolt against the modern world versus the meme with the surfer on it, um, they're, they're very different. On the other hand, here's a way to do, not, not, you know, not that this is a, a personal concern of mine, but as a scholar, if you were to try and find logic in the in the meme of the surfer on the wave, here's a way to, to kind of defend that, I think, through, through Evola. There is an understanding, <laughs> I think, inherent in this narrative of decline, inherent in this narrative that society itself is against you. Yeah. And, and that society is in some way irretrievably um, going going to be opposed and, and you need the, you know the safety that you can find in this world this is this very much parallels with Eric Jungner's uh, forest passage uh, De Waldgang, is is the way that you find safety is pulling yourself out of society in a sense and you'll find a new freedom if you do that if you reject discourse if you reject conversation if you reject surveillance attendant to those previous two things um, there you can find some other some other state of existence Embedded in all of that, Boaz, I think, is a partial rejection of words. It can be, at least. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if, if you want to talk about another arena of, in, of, of expression of, of Evolian and traditionalist thought, I think you would look to music. I think you'd look to neo-folk, um, Death in June, von Trunstall, uh, that, that area of, of music, which perhaps your listeners are familiar with. It's striking to me, if anyone wants to call that political music, it's a very strange type of political music because there's almost no denotational messaging in it. There's almost no plain, uh, semantically transparent language to be found there. And there's an abundance of literal nonsense utterances of la 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 do do do's there. Yeah. The deeper the deeper orientation of that is is that you know in this world riding the tiger I don't actually need to message I don't need to practice much what's what's important is is actually my removal and my rejection of society including its most its most mechanical and mundane institutions language among them yeah there was so I know this is a bit more of a philosophical answer than what what you asked for but I see I see I see a logic in that boiled down space as well that mm -hmm. might be existing parallel with the pop culturization of, of that. Yeah. Now that you mentioned music, uh, Arditi, which is, a, I think it's an Italian group that does exactly the same, no words, but the meaning is very loaded and, and understandable. The name of the author uh, of the, that editor at Arctus is John Bruce Leonard. Uh, I don't know if it rings the bell. Um, he's, he's been behind the, some of the Evola translations lately. And he, he's uh -huh. been writing, uh, I would say extensively about how to translate the Evola today. Um, but there is this spiritual gap that mm -hmm. always uh, appears. And I think you, you kind of struggle with this spiritual gap as well, or the, of the, the hiding aspect of it with mm -hmm. your conversations with Bannon. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, uh, as you can see, this is one of my topics. This is a spiritual uh, YouTube channel. So we talk about spirituality and it's, it's of much interest for, for me and the viewers to see how this spirituality is playing in this world and how it's the hiding, the hidden object, um, mm -hmm. how it is also uh, hiding for Ben that definitely and clearly you unearth a lot of the uh, the sources and the, the references that he has how how is this playing out and especially not only in the in the past that is well documented in your book but today that mm -hmm. might be more out of scope hmm. i know it's a very loaded question no one, no one has ever asked me this 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 wonderful question 
to love. <laughs> I, I've I've, I've given over a hundred interviews uh, since publishing this book in various formats, and no one I don't think anyone's asked me this. I don't know. Um, there, when I talk about Bannon's spirituality to most most of the people who I who who interview me and have been interested in the book, the general assumption has been that we're seeing an additional example of someone you know deflecting their agenda perhaps their selfishness perhaps their hypocrisy all of these unsavory aspects of their identity onto this amorphous thing called spirituality which no one really knows what it is and can't define mm -hmm. it and and thus that spirituality becomes a way of beautifying or or simply ornamenting what what are in fact very crude and familiar political instincts of greed of xenophobia of hatred of others yeah um and opposite that is is the possibility that that something is going on and that what what we're dealing with is that there's a there 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 is some actual agenda that uh, that exists is, is authentic in some sense, but but that we're really going to struggle to define it. And and that was you know something I commented on in the book. I said that when it, when I was really getting down to it, okay, let's you know it's, it's a game of twenty questions with Bannon. Okay, you want to close the borders. Well, why do you want to do that? Okay, you want to put tariffs on trade. Uh, you want to see a sort of cultural style and orientation in the US federal government that is more in line with the with the working class and implicitly the white working class in the United States. Why are we doing that? What's going to be the end goal, the end goal, end goal? And and he'd end up saying things like transcendence, imminence and transcendence, which which is a phrase that as as a as a kind of a, a, a social scientist, a humanistic social scientist, which I, which I consider myself one. I can't do a lot with that, and <laughs> and I I I can't really I can't decide. Here's here's something pointing in favor of there being a there there. Bannon, for all of his kind of usury of people, of ideas, of professions, of jobs, of money, of posts and offices, one thing that has been consistent in his in his life. Um, it has been, I think he's been a, a, at least a, a fairly present father figure to, to some of his children. And, um, but aside from that, the consistency, and he's also been very, very loving to his, to his blood relatives, I think to his siblings and his father. Um, but he has also been devoted to this world of alternative spirituality. However, however foolish someone might think it seems, whether it is traditionalism, whether it is Gurdjieff, whether it is theosophy, whether it is you know uh, transcendental meditation, that has always that has always been there. It's been there since the '70s. He's done it as he's moved in all these other different places. As he's been a Goldman Sachs banker, as he has been a Hollywood producer, a, a media figure for Breitbart, and eventually as a political activist. Most recently, he's always stuck with those interests, and and, and he's very, very deeply read in them. That doesn't mean that he doesn't make mistakes in his reference that he's not sloppy. He misattributes works and titles to the wrong authors, but he has he has read a lot of this stuff. Um, that might to someone suggest uh, that there that there is actual depth and content there. I, again, I don't know where I land on that. Um, that may seem unfortunate to some people. I actually think it's quite good as a scholar to find yourself in a position of, <laughs> eh, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but but that's 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 where I am. I mean, it's a million dollar question, uh, especially mm -hmm. I recall the the worship scenes in Hong Kong. It's Hong Kong that he's he's uh, going to the, the bookstore and finding the books. He's finding. I mean, is it, you have very brilliant uh, narrative moments like this one the townhouse or or for example the, the syria moment i also i also think it's with a confrontation with kushner it's i mean it's it's very very vivid and the the, the reading goes life. fast <laughs> <laughs> but right. th these ideas they're uh so pervasively 
present, especially um, I was very surprised by the Syria moment of Bannon, knowing that the, 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 the moment he, uh, he realizes that he's, he's doomed, um, how he handles fatalism in that way. I think that's, I don't know, I, I come from the, the history of mentalities, in the French histoire de mentalité. Uh, we like to read what is not written, to see things that are not seen, and always we, we put a lot of sauce on the things. But mm-hmm. that moment explains so much the, the depth of how, how he's thinking, this, this traditionalist idea of cycles of mm-hmm. let it go and... Uh, and just ride the tiger. I, I, I have this vibe, and it's all, only through your narrative. I mean, follow politics that way, but that that narrative brought me there. And I don't know if this is your your own perception of the of this type that is just bringing this this traditionalist let it go. It's like kind of a the opposite of the liberal laissez faire, but. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In a right. different interventionism way, yeah. Understood broadly, <clears throat> yeah. I one would have thought you can almost, if you want to draw an analogy between Bannon and Evola, you know that the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II has its analog when Bannon sees Trump bomb Syria, hmm. um, because he could have concluded. I've never had this conversation with him, but we could imagine it that he concludes at that moment, "Uh uh-huh, I thought Trump was in some way out of time or or had some, that that he could have been an agent who conflicted with and destroyed the prevailing instincts of of our era of U.S. foreign policy in this instance, but he didn't. It turns out that he himself is just an agent of this as well and finds himself in this position in the White House with a, with a military like the U.S. military, and he's able to just, uh, he's, he's unable, rather, um, to resist, and we end up bombing Syria. And, and shouldn't a new fatalism have gripped Bannon at that moment? He did understand that he was out. He was trying to sell to Jared Kushner <laughs> the yeah. idea that uh, of fatalism. You know, Kushner says, oh, there's, you know, there's all this horrible stuff happening in Syria. Don't you see that Assad is gassing the children? And Bannon says, eh, we're living in a dark age man, this is an age of death and destruction. Not what we can do about it. And of course, Kushner at that moment is like, this guy's crazy. Get him out of, the, get this guy out of the White House. We have, a, we have an apocalyptic, um, an agent of, of the apocalypse here who, who doesn't care and is indifferent to death and suffering. Um, that, so that's what's going on. But then you would think that Bannon would find himself then um, duped by the time cycle as yes, it were. Yes, that's the word. But he doesn't do that's not where he goes on afterwards right mm-hmm. he doesn't resign himself to the corruption of trump he goes on after his time in the white house with with a record of ferocious activity um a lot of which fails by the way and that that all spawned this in retrospect very stupid conversation in u.s media which i wish there was some accounting for everyone saying oh steve bannon is irrelevant and he's not, no one should stop interviewing, stop talking about him. He's relevant. He's out there trying to do something for himself to create these projects because he wants to be relevant and they're all failing. And this guy is a joke and he's a blowhard. He fooled us all into thinking he was a puppet master. Let's, let's have a blockade of Bannon. Yeah. Yeah. That's but he was working happened. against that. And, and, of, mm-hmm. and that, that conversation is over now. Uh, tell that to the, to the congressional committee investing, investigating January 6th, tell them that Bannon mm-hmm. is is irrelevant. They don't think he is because of things he has done since leaving the White House that perpetuate, continue contributing to um, his plan and his vision. You mentioned the the role of Trump and the idea of Trump that Bannon himself imagined that Trump had to fulfill. When I was reading this part in the book, I um, I immediately... uh, got to a topic of the, the mystery of the grail from Evola. And it's the, uh, the idea of the imperial saga and the universal ruler. And all the figures that throughout uh, early medieval to late medieval times have been developed, that coming from the East with wisdom, etc., and power from a greater ruler, the 
universal, uh, sovereign, all these types uh, are in the air when you are describing the way uh, Bannon sees Trump. And I'm not saying per se that he, he should be seen as the universal ruler, but some kind of a emissary of mm -hmm. uh, the heroic action that Evola theorizes and imagines, imagines uh, in his good years, I would say, the, the years that he's not depressed and lackless and things like that, that he still have some activity with Regini and, and company. Um, would you agree that there is some of these topics or I'm seeing too much here? Because I, I really, your book really made me um, review evil a lot in the lenses of the, the traditionalism today because it seems that there is this influence and then the the evolution distortion whatever it is from uh, the, these new actors mm. I, I i see where you're going with that i i i've i've never heard again i've never, I've never heard bannon say anything to that effect mm -hmm. before and it's not because he was at a loss for words for ways to characterize Trump grandly. <laughs> I bet. Um, so that that makes me think if he had that thought in his head that he would have said something to me because he, I mean, he, let's say the yellow vests in France, mm -hmm. You know, he had a sort of a sort of eschatological, metaphysical characterization of them relative to the red hats in of the MAGA movement, um, and uh, and and as I wrote in the book, he, he he seemed quite clearly to me, even though he wouldn't quite articulate, he wouldn't put it down, he seemed quite clearly to me to to be viewing Bannon to be viewing Trump through the lens of Savitri Devi. Mm -hmm. um, and this notion of men that can intervene in in time and relate to it in distinguished ways, and that Trump was a man in time, um, he flat out said that once. And then when I asked him later, it seemed to not not quite have all the connections in place. But he still called him said Donald Trump is a man in time. Um, yeah, remember that this is a Savitri Devi connection, very strong connection, very more sweet. than the, the Prestigeon or the traditional figures in the European imagination of medieval times. And and yes, I mean that was the that was the first and in this later on he goes on to say, you know, Trump his role in history is essentially a destroyer. It specifically it does not matter that Trump understands his role in history. Um what what simply matters is that he's a doer, not a knower. He's a doer, mm -hmm. not a thinker. And uh and that's fine. That's fine. He can Trump can actually be deluded about his own role in history, think of himself as a great regenerator and builder and creator whatever so long as he destroys because that's what he's supposed to do bannon had that entire conversation with me described De debbie's uh debbie's definition of a man in time and called trump a man in time um hmm. uh in in all of those senses so that was more the narrative that he was giving me i think the connections that you're spotting with evola really attest to the fact that these are a couple of different minds working within a body of thought that has has internal um drives and characteristics and form to it yeah so yeah for sure it's i wouldn't like to call it syncretic but it's like is a purpore of uh readings from the fringes that come together they don't need to necessarily have uh you know a, <laughs> a understanding that it's you know homogeneous it's yeah. just whatever it comes and then we create a new product. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and sometimes it takes, you know, it takes a, an outside reader to, to see that and it doesn't, they don't have to be together, but they're clear. They're obviously affordances for certain ideas. Um, um, it, I've, I've mentioned this and there, there are other people who've done this, plenty of other people who've done this, but you know, you could take Ride the Tiger by Avila, Death of the West, Decline of the West. Um, and, uh, and, the Forest Passage by by Ernst Jünger, mm -hmm. and see a lot of they, they kind of belong together. It's and it's very hard from if you've studied that and you've had that experience. I also like with with Steve. I just kind of wanted to hear him talk about Ernst Jünger, oh, and had to really watch myself. Not not because I care, but just because I just want to. You just want to see these ideas played with. You want to see 
um, certain certain latent connections in affordances elaborated. Um, but you have to, as a as a as a scholar, as a commentator, trying to understand what he's thinking and not just exploring my own thinking. You have to kind of wait, <laughs> yeah. let your research subject do the work for you. How is Bannon talking about the Valgan? Uh, uh, talk, uh, he 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 had never read it. He had never read it. Yes, <laughs> but he was talking about it. He was no. He 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 talks about other Ernst Jünger stuff, but he okay. never really actually um, the Valgan. But that was just more connection that I had with stuff. Interesting. That he and with and with Evola. No, he, although he really he knows Ernst Jünger. I mean, Storm of Steel. He was very um, very taken by. It. Actually, wanted to make a movie of it once upon a time. So but he, had, he hadn't read Valgan. No. How how in in these all these. Uh cocktail we have all over the Caravaggio, how we can uh, position himself being from, well, Dugin is also from a different background, but he's more, I would say, more eccentric in the fact that he's from Southern Hemisphere and from not uh, one of the main powers that have been shaping history. How... Olavo de Carvalho. Yeah. 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 I mean, Brazil is not one of these. It's not Russia. Yeah. It's not America. It's something different, but he definitely is in the equation and he has a, a very relevant uh, role in your book. And mm -hmm. I assume he has a relevant role or he had a relevant role in traditionalism. Um, or we should be nuanced about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Brazil, uh, it, it is a site of a lot of interest in Julius Evola. Um, it's not a unified core. That there, there are sort of Evolians in Brazil who split. You have kind of hardcore Catholics mm -hmm. uh, followers who are, you know, for whom Olavo was is, is kind of the centerpiece, and then you have Duganist Evolians in Brazil, and the two and they don't get along, and you know, occasionally they've gotten together at meetings. But that says something that that Brazil of all places has a large enough community that it can have factions that fight with each other over 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 Julius Evola. But it's not just that. Brazil turns out to be the place where uh, Evolians and sort of pseudo traditionalists get closest to formal political power. Um, and I'm referring, yes, to Olavo, who was seen as a sort of guru of Jair Bolsonaro. Um, I don't, I don't chafe at that characterization. I think if you look at his influence, it's it's fair to call him that, even though Bolsonaro himself has distanced himself to that to that characterization. Um, outside of the government, but still still exerting a tremendous amount of influence on it. We have that, and. Uh, but we also ended up with a, a faction of Bolsonaro's cabinet that were essentially chosen by Olavo. It was called the Olavista branch of yeah. the cabinet. Within that branch, the foreign minister, Ernesto Araujo, who in some way, shape, or form is himself a traditionalist. Um, he'd qualify it. He has, just like Bannon does, different ways of, of thinking about it. Um, but, but he is very, very intelligent very, very interesting for being a, 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 a politician, a civil servant, has, has, a, has a pretty, pretty well-read uh, philosophical background, is philosophically literate in ways that, that I don't think John Kerry, for example, would be, or Tony Blinken today, um, Rex Tillerson, any of these people. So you've got this, this guy in Brazil um, who can cite Ganon, Dugan, Evola, quickly, offhand, accurately, has read their works, has also, like Bannon, been studying their works for a long time. This is very strange. It's more significant to me than Bannon, who was an advisor um, in, in the Trump White House for, uh, for a while. But to have an actual minister, the, the foreign minister of Brazil, being that in-depth, that this is something new for traditionalism. And what are the fruits of this novelty? The, the fruits could be um, a tremendous amount of conflict with China. Um, they, they could be uh, a great deal of conflict with Brazil's educational system, its university world, 
um, and potentially, depending on how you want to look at things, also just failure for the traditionalist himself in this case. So they are not producing new ideas or having a regeneration moment because they have power. They simply are uh, manifesting a political agenda that could be loosely traditionalist inspired, but it's not benefiting directly the generation of ideas. So there is no new generation per se. No, appropriately, some might say, because a traditionalism doesn't need evangelism and it doesn't need mm -hmm. it, it, the, the fatalist uh, currents in it would, would seem to point, point politicians in that way. But no, my, my conclusion, I mean, a conclusion of the book is that we should read the emergence of these figures more as a symptom rather than rather than a cause. Um, and and that they also are probably not themselves going to going to do that much to to advance uh, to advance their visions, with the exception of disruption, they were tremendously disruptive. Yeah, and whether or not that leads to generation in the way that traditionalists might might think it should is is something of an open question. In in the case of Brazil, Araújo was was I, I think a more a more let me try and find a, a neutral tone tone I was wanting to say fanatical but a a more impassioned opponent of his country's connection with China whose primarily primary flaw is not just its communism but it's it's communism representative of uh, spiritual uh, emptiness materialism and globalization and mass unification. Um, these other concepts. That's what co communism is—a sort of front for all those deeper things, and and because of that, um, he took he took a much more aggressive stance to trying to decouple Brazil and, and China to pull their economies apart and gradually move in his mind toward a part of the world that had more spiritual character to it and did not have the same globalizing uh, globalizing uh, drives for itself. Mm -hmm. So and and. and we have the you know the coronavirus comes along. China starts withholding and playing with its vaccine and its deliveries to Brazil, and eventually to get one of the concessions was getting Araujo out yeah. of his post. So some real high level diplomatic moves were were taken around the disruption of these Olavistas in Brazil because of that. In in the United States, you know what did Trump accomplish? It, it, throwing our democratic institutions, you could say, the electoral process, the Republican Party, into a state of disarray and pseudo semi chaos. If if that is the product, I think that that's something that Bannon would celebrate. If it if it meant that certain uh, ministries, uh, institutions, offices in in the very large what Bannon thought of was a swollen federal government started to contract. If public trust and investment in them started to wane, um, that might not seem like anyone's accomplished anything. But I think I think for Bannon that 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 would be something of an accomplishment potentially. Those are the sorts of impacts we see. You could you could even look to Hungary. There's there's an interesting story I did that that played out in the party Jobbik, which was this, mm -hmm. this extreme, very very far right party, and they uh, they had. You know, you had a traditionalist party leader for a period of time with Gabor Vona and a traditional spiritual advisor to the party leader, um, a really exceptional state of affairs there. And in that, too, ended up in a loss of positions into sort of chaos and disarray. But I'm not sure that the party leader, Tibor Baranyi, who was not really happy to be speaking to me um, while I was writing the book, he even said to Gabor Vona, if I'm to believe this from, from, from Vona, that he really didn't care about the success, the electoral success of Jobbik. He had other things, other visions going on. And if the party formally, you know, was, you know, failed in elections and fell into disarray, that doesn't matter. Yeah. There, were, there were other things going on. And, and that, that spirit, I think, is, is something that we see play itself out quite, quite a bit with, with these actors. Lots of action, but very few words. Um, very few wars. Words. Uh, these oh, people words. are not are not producing. I mean, Oliver probably he did produce a lot, but 
and Dugin is producing more geopolitical stuff. Bannon is definitely not producing, but Hungary is not having a, a machinery of traditionalist publications coming from, stemming from these people. So um, do we have emerging figures to replace the activists that are more intellectually oriented, more theorists than uh, doers? Or is, is there a void? right now in traditionalism? I don't see anything yet. I wouldn't look, I wouldn't look for self-identifying traditionalists necessarily to fill this void. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you can generalize the figures that I've seen and say that they, the, f the figures that I've studied and say that they, their real signature is that they are looking for extreme alternatives, radical alternatives, if we want to be a little bit more dispassionate about it, to the liberal democratic standard. They want to find, they see that liberal democracy globalization um, has arrived at a point where it, it really shouldn't have the same purchase on the future. And they want something different. And traditionalism uh, can appeal in that context because is it is it fair to say the most the most dramatic contrast to 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 liberal progressivism to modern progressivism? Pretty you much. Imagine? Uh, it it's it, it'd certainly be a contender. We could sit around and try and dream up another account of history and humanity that could, that negated liberal values more. But um, but traditionalism is going is, is going to be up there. So that's part of the appeal, and I think that we should be looking for other ideologues. Let's call them weirdos to <laughs> use a, a technical term. Um, weird in the sense that they do not want to be a liberal right, a liberal conservatism. They want to go back to some sort of pre-modern uh, anti-liberal ideal to find to find a dramatic contrast with with our present. There's there was something made in a review of my book of Dominic Cummings in in the UK in that mm -hmm. he this this advisor this kind of eccentric advisor to um, to Johnson wanted in turn to find literally the, the word was weirdos to work underneath him uh, to kind of troll the landscape of alternative political ideologies to see what else is out there that's what I'm going to be interested in um, I don't think. I, I don't think Putin and Russia are that actual anti intellectual anti-liberalism. Um, I think that's that's more actually state power mm -hmm. um, uh, and and kind of real politique just against another another coalition of state powers and the ideology is kind of an excuse for for adding color to the opposition. So I don't think that is going to be there. I would I would look more at these. Um, at these European movements, first and foremost, and see w what's happening there is that hunger for an alternative still expressing itself and making opportunities for figures like Ban and Olavo and Dugan to come. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, this this probably has been the question that's been uh, more in my mind. What's what's next? for uh, traditionalism, what are the next steps, challenges, what the new figures, uh, the trends that are having more relevance or focus uh, within the movement, but also uh, taking into account current events, how uh, the war in Ukraine is going to be reshaping uh, most of the, uh, the, the trends that could have been set up for the COVID pandemic and uh, now is need to reroute again because events are events and uh, the the known attains you <laughs> right the the what's significant about ukraine for me again if we focus on europe is that whereas russia had been a sort of dividing political line within a number of political contexts um so, suddenly the, the invasion of ukraine collapse that. And we did see, let's say the far right, the very kind of ideological terrain that Russia, via Dugan in some instances, was trying to cultivate for itself mm -hmm. in Europe, um, that it has lurched back away. It's lurched toward its political mainstream. 
as if to say, okay, we have these, these uh, again, we talked about this earlier in, this, in our conversation today, we have these profound political disagreements in our, in our, in our electorate and in our political life. Um, we think that, they, that they're all definitive, but oh, guess what? If we get an alternative out there to the East, we might see that we share more in common. We actually do belong to the same political family. Um, if 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 we get some context to see what what might be out there, and that we we've, we've seen some collapsing there. I, Sweden is one case in particular. Italy is another. I think Italy is more dramatic because there you had a more expressly pro Russian yeah. political force with Salvini turning turning back away from Putin. Even with Le Pen, despite the fact that her her approach to Russia is going to be more tepid than uh, than Macron, we've still seen a change in her rhetoric. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, and, and in the case of Sweden, you saw actual activism. You saw a, a switch in support f in favor of NATO, which was fairly dramatic, coming from the Sweden Democrats, the Nationalist Party in that in that in that country. Um, even though they weren't they weren't pro Putin before necessarily, they still made this 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 very very striking transformation in their in their politics. So. So, so that consolidation is, is, is happening. I, I wonder long term if we see if we see a sort of unification of a political spectrum in a lot of places like Sweden, mm -hmm. um, if that is going to do, if that's going to set the stage uh, for a new set of alternatives, because we tend to see that in the political spectrum, that if, if, if there's mass agreement on some major issue, and uh, and and all political forces seem to seem to form consensus with each other. Then they leave an open gap in a political in a spectrum, and someone will come in to fill that. That's how a lot of the populist parties came into power in Sweden, among other places. There wasn't a criticism of of immigration and multiculturalism within their political spectrum from the left or the right. They were all unified on this, and it made this gap that the nationals came in and filled became the fastest growing political party in in sweden's modern history because of that will yeah. something like that happen and we get a more genuinely cultivated anti-liberalism i don't know but that's to me that that that's at least my read of the um of the terrain so lots of realignment and uh open-ended uh narratives mm -hmm. right now could be hmm. could be that's interesting because uh, this means that traditionalism has no defined direction as 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 a school of thought or intellectual uh, movement. It's in the waiting. It's it's it's, it's waiting okay. for some definition. It's subject. it's subject for other to other changes. It doesn't control its own destiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at least the political traditionalism. I think that's fair to say. Um, you know, the, the activities of spiritualists, I've, I've had a lot of contact with Charles Upton, uh, yeah. you know, who he is, who wants no part of any of this. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> know that you, you can introduce but... Upton to the audience if you want, just, uh, just. Oh, okay. Oh, this is, this is an, an American traditionalist, uh, Charles Upton, who wrote a book called Dugan versus Dugan, Dugan against Dugan. Yeah. Um, and the, the court claim is a very long book saying that Dugan is not a traditionalist. And these are all the reasons why. And and he makes makes an elaborate case for it. And even though I disagree with him, it, the di disagreement is not one about texts and ideas. It's it's about a sort of social and anthropological reality um, and political reality based on actions. But but certainly the text is it's a compelling and interesting study of of uh, of thought in and of itself. Um, so that that apolitical traditionalist world, I think, will will move on on its own course independently of all of this. But um, but I think that the the political actors we've seen, including Dugan, who, who really gets his platform in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, I do see them as as reacting rather than driving. Interesting. Yeah. So the whole political traditionalist scene is reacting right now in I think front so. of the war. Hmm. I think so. The latest position of Dugin, I think it appeared four or five days ago, a long article on Ukraine, uh, where we see, you know, lots of uh, known places in the in the in the work of Dugin, but we we see as well uh, this continuation of war 
or this endless war as a as a way of life in the uh, creation of this Eurasian space. Um, is this something that is reactive to the to the response, the Western response to the war and the invasion, or it is something deeper that goes to the uh, what Dugin carries intellectually with him? That's a great, that's a, I can't answer that question. I mean, I think that <laughs> you can hear both explanations from Dugan. He's, he would say what they are fighting in Ukraine is the same thing that they were fighting in Georgia. It's not Ukraine or Georgia. It is Western liberalism yeah. and, 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 and its universality, its universal claims for itself, its inability to accept any border as being meaningful. Yeah. Right. So I... <laughs> As to whether or not that's true, I don't know. You don't need me for that <laughs> to, <laughs> to tell you whether or not I think it's true. I'm not, and, and, and I'm not, I, my, I've always wanted to hear more of an explanation, let's say from a political traditionalist in, in the Duganist camp, what are we to make of the fact that Ukraine has been a sort of proto-nation for so long? What are we to make mm -hmm. of the fact that, in the, by, you know, in the, by the early 1800s, the the russian state was felt it was necessary to actively sanction and prohibit the ukrainian language um the, these are these are not the actions of of someone who is in some sort of harmonic harmonious uh coexistence with uh with a with you know the true essence of a people this is this is a state of attempting to impose a political boundary uh onto a cultural landscape that seems to resist that political boundary yeah. Um, I don't. I don't see. I, I don't. I don't see that narrative. If you look at history, if you study a little bit of Ukrainian history, I don't see that narrative um, that would be pushed of a more authentic uh, cultural boundary that doesn't align with our present political boundaries. I just. I just don't see it. So on on that note, Boaz, I'm going to have to to move to my next. Uh, yeah. No. I, we we uh, generally keep it on an hour. We've you know, with a little bit of margin, but yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ben, to be here. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to uh, invite all the of the viewers to read your book again. I think it's a, it's a great book that uh, explains a lot of why we are here today and why this channel exists in many other ways. Um, and I'm um, looking forward uh, to reading you uh, another time and in your uh, future publications i don't know you have anything cooking in the oven <laughs> oh not 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 quite yet nothing that's not quite yet that. okay <laughs> we'll look forward to that thank you so much ben thank you so much bro it's a pleasure to be with you thanks for the questions